This episode is brought to you by... Build compelling real-time apps quickly and scale them globally with the PubNub real-time network. Only PubNub delivers the core building blocks needed for any real-time application. Find out for yourself by signing up for free today. Visit PubNub.com. Keller and Otto thinks there's an injustice being done to robots. They are too expensive for the common person and no one is doing anything about it. So they end up stuck in car manufacturing plants and not in our living rooms. This is the single driving force behind Remotive, the company he co-founded with partners Fu and Peter. Remotive is democratizing the affordable robot by starting simple. Meet Romo, the little robot that could. Combining smartphones and a mobile base, Romo enters our lives not as a dance partner, but as a natural extension to the things we already do. What you don't see when Romo boots around a room or gets scared or smiles is that spark of imagination that will hopefully inspire a legion of robot-loving nerds that take this simple first step and run with it. I'm, the, I'm Keller. Uh, I'm the CEO and co-founder of Remotive. What does Remotive do? Uh, easier to show than tell, right? Okay. So we build smartphone robots that use an iPhone or an iPod as their brain. Um, so, <laughs> so I can basically plug any iPhone in and he, he wakes up and he's a creature. I think right now he's in face follow mode. So he's actually tracking my face. It's a little easier to see if I put him here. So he's actually using computer vision to follow my face wherever I go. It's incredible. Yeah, and so basically our goal is to create robots that, uh, I mean, we, we were nerds when we were growing up. We watched Star Trek and Star Wars and um, always figured that robots would make our lives awesome. Robots remain one of the great unfulfilled promises of science fiction, largely because the robots today that, that larger companies are making are too complicated and too expensive for normal people. Is, so, that, the, is that the biggest challenge right now? Is that the, the fact that, I mean, we were just talking about this a second ago, is that I'm not really comfortable with having another humanoid in there that is a robot. It seems too yeah. complicated. Yeah, I, I, um, I think that that's absolutely the challenge. I think that people are generally here, I'm going <laughs> to put Robo into a different mode so he's a little less excited. Um, so I think generally that that's absolutely uh, I think what's fascinating is that a lot of the innovation that's happened over the last 10 or 15 years in, like the, in the, on the internet and in mobile has been design innovation. It's been people figuring out how to take technology that's already there and make it available to you know, tens of millions of people. Um, and interestingly, the exact opposite has happened in robotics over the last 15 years. It remains, robots remain largely in academic labs and factories, and it's all research, it's all technology. Almost no work has been done in terms of the design and, and turning robots into actual products that people can use. And so we think that a lot of the technology is already there. It's, it's a lot more powerful than people realize. It's just that we need companies coming along and trying to figure out how to turn these robots into things that people actually want to have in their homes and into products that are simple enough that, uh, that non-technical people can actually live with them and, and these robots can make people's lives better. What, what was it about um, the mobile space? Like, why, why pick an iPhone? Why pick a smartphone for this? So, uh, it comp so we, we think that in order to build a really compelling personal robot, uh, it needs to be Wi-Fi enabled and computer vision capable. That, that's kind of table stakes. Um, those kinds of robots in the past have cost between twenty-five and fifty thousand dollars, which I can't afford. Maybe you can, but um, so you know, we 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 didn't have enough money to buy those kinds of robots, and so we were like, well, we we need to figure out some way of building a robot that can do those things, but for a lot cheaper. And the advantage of using smart devices is that uh, they're not only ubiquitous at this point, but they're almost extraneous. A lot of families have an extra iPod or an extra old iPhone sitting around. There's kind of a question of what are you going to do with these devices anyway. Uh, and the manufacturers of these devices are at massive scale, so the cost is uh, very low. Uh, but they have powerful processors, and they have a Wi-Fi chip, and they have a great camera, all the things that you need to basically uh, serve as the, the, the core platform for a smart robot. And so using them allows us to build a robot that does the things that twenty-five dollars or $50,000 robots do, but Romo costs $150. So what are the core things that this thing can do as a result of, of plugging in an iPhone? So 
Um, you know, we've only been working on him for about a year and a half, but we, but right now he has three core functionalities. So the first is learning about computer science. He's, he's programmable, he's trainable. Um, and so uh, both kids and adults who use Romo can, can create custom functionalities and personalities for the robot just by uh, essentially setting up these if-then clauses. And I, I, could, I could show you that. Um, but so, so that's the first thing. The second thing is that he's a, a pet and a friend. Uh, so he is, we use computer vision and a whole bunch of, um, uh, we use computer vision to allow him to basically tell what's going on in the world and then react accordingly. Uh, and we kind of think that that's kind of a fundamental human need. Like everybody wants that, it's just that it's really hard to do. Uh, a lot of products kind of fake it, like Furby kind of fakes the fact that it knows what's going on even though it doesn't. Uh, we think it's really compelling to create something that actually can like look around and see who it's interacting with and, and how those people are feeling and empathize with them. And then finally, you can log into him from any smart device, anywhere, any iOS device anywhere in the world. It streams two-way audio and video. So uh, you can essentially use Romo for telepresence, which again, telepresence robots tend to cost $10,000 or more. Romo costs 150 bucks. Um, and because we're basically making telepresence available to families, it's really cool because we are seeing all these use cases like uh, people using Romo to babysit kids uh, while you know the mom is like upstairs or, or something is that like that. Kind of like driving in cruise control and thinking that they're actually driving your car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, 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 right now Romo's not is not a good idea to leave Romo alone with the kids and like leave the house because if there were a fire, like Romo can't evacuate the kids. Um, but it is really cool, like the possibilities, for example, for grandma to log in and like follow her grandkids from room to room and interact with them, or for a dad who's traveling a lot, for him to be able to log into a robot and go from like kids' room to kids' room saying goodnight to them. There's just a lot of things that you can't do over Skype and FaceTime that robots are naturally suited for. I love it, and they can eventually tuck them in. Yeah. O outside of what you're doing with Remotive, is there anything that's, there's got to be something that I inspires you, fascinates you in the mobile space? Um, yeah, I, I, the thing that we're most fascinated by. Well, so we're we're geeks. Like we're we're, we're um, we love science fiction, and so the thing that's most fascinating to us, both because it relates to robots and because we just think it's beautiful, are heads-up displays like Google Glass. Uh, we think that that is. I just love when I see companies go do things like, whoa, we don't need to reinvent the wheel. Let's just go read science fiction from 50 years ago and let's do that. Um, I think that like so few companies like Elon Musk, right, with, with SpaceX and with, and with Tesla and now Google with uh, the heads up display, I just feel like they're just saying, okay, let's just make science fiction a reality. And that's very much part of our vision. And I think that heads-up displays are the future. And really is, it, is, it, is it because it, it, it's, um, you know, they're taking something that is so intangible, right? Something mm -hmm. that we've seen, you're right, for 50, 60 years. Something that we've all grown up with in, right. from Star Trek and Gene Roddenberry. And, um, and they're making it, they're democratizing it. Is that, what, is that what you guys are doing here with this? You're democratizing yeah. robots? That's exactly the goal. The goal is to put a robot into every uh, family's home in the world. Uh, we think that there are things that robots can do that would make our lives dramatically better. Someone just needs to figure out how to design robots so that they're actually accessible um, to people other than researchers and, and factories. More than vacuuming my floor. Yes, <laughs> definitely <laughs> more. Robots are not just going to be vacuums. <laughs> I promise you that in 10 years, the prominent consumer robot won't be a vacuum. What about, uh, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big statement, what about, uh, what do you hope that you, the lasting impression of this is? Where do you, what do you hope that this starts or what do you, where do you hope it ends? So we, um, in, in the same way that, uh, uh, you know, I, I, I think a lot about this, um, this poster that Apple had. It was one of their marketing, it was a piece of their marketing collateral when they were coming out with one of the very first personal computers. And it, it said, I think it said, the Mac, the personal slash home computer. And what's so fascinating about this is they had no idea whether a personal computer was a good idea or not when they were building it. And in fact, Apple, they didn't, weren't even the people who discovered the killer use case for their own product. That was done by Dan Brooklyn at VisiCalc, uh, at Harvard Business School when he invented VisiCalc, which was the first spreadsheet software. So we're very much of the opinion that we aren't positive what the killer use case in robotics is. So the most important thing to us is creating an ecosystem where people can actually build software for Roma, where people can use our SDK to create new behaviors, new functionalities, new personalities. Um, make it, an, make it a, 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 an open ecosystem so that whether you're you know, uh, uh, 10 years old or 30 years old, people should be able to train robots to do new things. and. Um, and make them better. Like we're only a team of 15 people. There's only so much we can do. So our goal is to, if we can enable a thousand people, then 
I think that that's, that's what it's going to take to basically make robots ubiquitous in our lives. An army of robot-loving nerds. Yeah, that that's sounds wicked. good. Thank you for doing this. I appreciate your time, man. <laughs> yeah, thanks.